Welcome to Rutland Weekend Television. Sorry I haven't been around too much in this series, but I've been working on my own show. Well, not so much my own show as somebody else's, but I've been working for the BBC, actually, at Bristol, a lovely place. You meet all the stars, yes. Anyway, now it's time on this channel for the Rutland Play. Stand and deliver. What? Stand and deliver. Stand and deliver what? Just a minute. Darling, he's a highway man. I didn't know they had them in this part of Surrey. Oh, yes, right. Your money or your life. Well? I'm thinking it over. It's a difficult one, this. Uh, I think I'll take the money. Right. No, 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 no. You're supposed to give the money. I give you the money? Yes. Oh, I see. And what if I don't? I'll kill you. What, with that pistol? Well, I make a very loud bang. Well, you should say, your money or a very loud bang. All right. Your money or a very loud bang. Do I bite his legs, sir? Uh, no, Thompson. Can I die for you, sir? No, no. Shall I commit suicide, sir? Shut up! Wait a minute. I recognise you. No! No, you don't. Not with this mask on. Yes, I do. You're my accountant. Not necessarily. Yes, you're smithers of accounts. Possibly. What are you doing here, smithers? I have taken to a life of crime in order to highlight the unpleasant working conditions of the professional classes. Cow dung. All right, I like robbing people. Fair enough. So hand over all your money or suffer an extremely loud bang. Oh, look, darling. Help is at hand. The Eighth Cavalry. <laughs> If you were to use my body as a shield, sir, then all his bullets would hit only me. Shut up! Look over there! <laughs> the lone accountant. The legendary master accountant whose name nobody knows. I thought his name was the lone accountant. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, maybe it's his second name they don't know. Hi-ho, silver and gilt-edge securities! Wherever chartered accountants go off the rails, wherever professional gentlemen stoop to unnecessarily fraudulent acts, wherever there is manital misconduct amongst the middle classes, there you will find the lone accountant. Actually, I don't have anything to do with manital misconduct. I take an interest purely in what goes on between the balance sheets. Come on, silver. The Lone Accountant. Damn. He hasn't seen us either. Shall I kill myself, sir? What? It's a diversion. Then when I'm stiff, you can throw me at him. Oh, shut up. Hey, I like your pistol. Yes, yes. It's, um, uh, it's very nice. What? Well, just a pistol, you know. Oh, it's, um, so big. Yes, uh, it, it is, it is big, isn't it? Yes. Mm. I like a pistol on a man. It's 
so exciting. Oh, yeah. Do you... Do you think I could touch it? What? Oh, please, just a little touch. Well, I, I, don't, I don't... Please. It, it won't hurt. Just a little touch. Well, all right. loan accountant? Yes, that's right. Actually, I'm not strictly speaking the loan accountant. No? No, I've got a pal who's always with me. Well, actually, he's sort of a male friend. Oh, I see. Yes, he's an Indian. Oh, our Indian friend. Actually, I don't know why people call me the loan accountant. I'm never alone. You have your Indian friend. Yes. Actually, he's more than a friend. Oh, yes? Yes, he's a business partner. Keep us up it. Tonto finished Mr. Yates' half yearly accounts. Ah, thank you, Tonto. Well? Philosophy, Kimusabi. Oh, right, Tonto. Uh, tis better that a man finish his half yearly accounts than that his half yearly accounts be left unfinished. Thank you, Kimusabi. Quite frankly, it annoys me they call me the loan accountant when they know I always have Mr. Tonto with me. I think it's because he's a not properly British person. Tonto, what's this on Mr. Yates's account? Scalps, scalpels, and general scalping equipment. Ah, I put that down as general business expense, Kimosabi. Oh, I don't think the taxman's going to wear this, Tonto. Oh, dear. Got to put it down as uh, business expenses or okay. theatre tickets or something. Okay, Kimosabi. Is Kimosabi your real name? No. No, I don't know why he calls me that all the time. Quite frankly, it's very irritating. Actually, his accountancy methods are a little unusual, but um, he does scare the pants off the inland revenue. Anyway... <sighs> Yes? What can I do for you? What can I do for you? Well, sir, I'm from the accountancy squad at Scotland Yard. And we've been having mysterious reports of a master accountant robbing passers-by on the B4132. Yes? Well, sir, you are an accountant. Yes? Well, sir, you also wear a mask. So, of all the master accountants in Surrey, you suspect me? There is only you. Oh, grow up, Sonny. There are hundreds. Mr. Defreitas, Mr. Berger, Mr. Nicholas. <laughs> See? We accountants are no longer ashamed to wear our masks in public, Inspector. Ah, Miss Grayson. These tax returns have just come in, Kimo Savvy. Don't call me Kimo Savvy at the office. You know how he gets. I can see I owe you an apology, sir. Not at all, Inspector. Come along, Tonto. We must find this rogue accountant and bring him to account. D'accord, Kimo Savvy. Oh, and Inspector, I think you'd better wear this. Do you wear the mask all the time? What do you mean? Well, I mean, do you wear it in bed? Well, sometimes. Supposing you cut me with a knife. Yes, and I bled all over him. No, it would never work, Thompson. There they are, Inspector. Where's the inspector? He keep falling down, Kimosabi. Him not used to mask. Okay, Tonto. There they are. Get him. I just wound him, Kimosabi. Fine, Tonto. Tonto would not kill him. Okay. <coughs> oh dear, missed. Quickly, Tonto. Sorry, Kimosabi. Too many gin and tonic at lunchtime. <gasps> A little bit further to the right. Sorry, Kimosabi. You've shot the inspector. All right, well, you have go. You're the Indian. You promise not to bring that up. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to mention it. Always this question of me being Indian. Quickly, he's running away. Indian, Indian, Indian. You think it easy being an Indian and an accountant? Damn. Oh, well, you can't win them all. Incidentally, sorry about the Indian business. Well, not too bad, it's all right. 
So the highwoman got away, and the lone accountant and Tonto were prosecuted for causing unnecessary deaths and being an Indian. And they duly appeared in court before the eccentric Mr. Justice Jeffrey. Lone accountant and Tonto, the verdict of this court is guilty as charged. I therefore sentence you to be taken from this place to a luxury steamer for a fortnight in New York with a friend of your choice or cash equivalent or a canteen of Danish cutlery, or a complete set of calf-bound encyclopedias, Ooh. or a night out with a talky dentist. What is your choice? We should like to be sentenced to the calf-bound encyclopedias, please, Milan. Very well. The sentence of this court is that you will be given a complete set of calf-bound encyclopedias as a warning to others. One each, Tom. This should teach you a lesson that you'll never forget. However, should you appear in front of this bench again, I must warn you that I shall sentence you to at least a brand new Ford Cortina, plus an extensive range of household furnishings and fittings, including a blender, ten kitchen chairs, and a new Hoovermatic washing machine. Court adjourned. Judge Jeffrey is causing a sensation in judicial circles. It's not just his private life of discos and dancing till dawn, nor the fast cars and the lovely pliant female companions. He's been seen out publicly with Elton John. He ran onto the pitch recently when United scored and hugged Lou Macari before being escorted off. A civil misdemeanour for which he sentenced himself to ten days at the Hilton. But it's his handing out of punishments that have attracted howls of protest. Well, I, I'd been doing a lot of thieving, you know, uh, breaking and entering and that sort of thing. And I, I come up in front of Jeffrey, and I'm guilty in that, you know. And, and he gives me a job as a bank manager. I mean, blimey, I can hardly hold my head up in front of me mates. Some disappointed criminals have been caught actually hiding in prison trying to do time they haven't been sentenced to. But it's not only the criminals who complain. He sentenced me to two years. Well, I was on a jury. Lawyers, too, disapprove of his eccentricities. Yes, I rose to protest a legal point, and he sentenced me to dinner with Princess Margaret. I protested to the Law Society, naturally. There seems little anyone can do to prevent little acts of kindness in court. This is Richmond Crosby, on the spot, in Bristol. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. And now, here's Neil Innes. <laughs> Where? <laughs> Here. <laughs> oh. Hello. Oh, now, here's a song.
bought her clothes and took her everywhere. They were married in Las Vegas. She said solemnly, I do. Amidst TV cameras and Yankee Ballyhoo. Bella frequented the nightclub scene. As befits an ex-beauty queen She took to drink while her playboy played And so it was the love decay Drama on a Saturday night A story of human emotion Love is as shallow as people And as deep as the ocean Bella took a gun Bella shot him dead He died instantly The coroner said And so behind dark glasses Bella hid her eyes It's unsightly when a woman cries But just who was to blame The press would soon find out But as it was, the jury had no doubt The verdict was guilty, the judge had no choice He said you get life in a serious voice But Bella just laughed and tearfully said Oh, what a joke, I've always been dead Saturday night A story of human emotion Love is as shallow as people And as deep as the ocean Drama on a Saturday night A story of human emotion Love is as shallow as people And as deep as the ocean Going on safari? Well, hardly. Not really, but in a sort of way. Not entirely, but up to a point. Well, Get on with it! Oh, sorry. In fact, this is no ordinary safari park at all. Indeed, here I don't even have to get out of my car to see the animals. Because in this safari park, the animals are already in the car. Yes. Here, you can drive the animals around the park yourself. It saves all the bother and trouble of having to look out of the car window. Plus, you get the real feel of the animals. Sounds like a lot of fun. Or, if you prefer it, You can even be driven by the animals. This is probably the only safari park in the world where the animals drive around and look at the tourists. But this is not the only unusual park that has opened recently. Here at the safari car park, visitors can walk around in perfect safety and comfort while photographing and admiring cars in their natural state. Here, a cluster of Cortinas sprawl in the shade. There, an old Morris idly eyes a friendly little French Citroen. Providing you obey the signs and keep your distance, as some of these cars are killers, you can enjoy the freedom of the vehicles. Some people even build cleverly camouflaged hides to watch the rarer cars parked. But the ordinary tourist is content to watch the Fiats taking a bath or to see the Beatles having a medical checkup. Of course, you can see cars in an ordinary zoo. Here's a French Renault in Bristol Zoo. It's feeding time. But the Renault shows no interest. It looks tired and listless compared with the splendid freedom of the other cars 
parked in their natural state. Oi! Robin! Oh. And so we say farewell to the safari car park and return you to the studio. Oh, look, I'm sorry. Look, I had to say that. Look, please, look. I'm sorry, look, I had to do that. I had to say that. This sexual freedom is certainly a tricky business. Yes, yes, it is. I mean, how can the individual develop sufficiently within the constraining bond of a single marriage? True, true. Is not the licentiousness that is condemned by the so-called moralists rather not the freedom to develop the freedom of choice? Yes, yes. Whereas the marriage license is in fact a constraint upon liberty. Freely entered into. Freely entered into may happen granted, but nonetheless considered empirically a constraint upon pure freedom. Well put. And that's why I slept with your wife, Jack. Oh, that's rather interesting, Ronald, because in point of fact I slept with your wife. Ah, I never knew you'd slept with Teresa. No, no, we didn't tell you, no. No. We didn't tell you, firstly because we didn't want to hurt you, and secondly because we didn't want to tell you. Very fair. She's a wonderful thinker, Teresa. And superb in bed. Superb in bed, but nonetheless a first-rate mind. A first-rate mind. Second-rate body. Second-rate body, but, but first-rate first rate mind, mind, yes. I didn't know you'd slept with Janice, Ronald. No, I told you because I wanted to hurt you. Ah, fair enough. Plus, of course, I'm in love with Janice. Aha, the nub. The very nub, yes. Are you in love with Teresa? No. No, neither am I. First-rate mind. Second-rate body. Whereas Janice... Second-rate mind. First-rate body, yes. Yeah. Well, look, we're both civilised people. Absolutely. We're sensitive, sensible human beings. Certainly. We'd better fight for her. Fair enough. Just a minute, Ronald and Jack. Oh, Teresa and Janice. The very same. Oh, hello, we were just speaking of you. Were you proposing to fight over us? Well, perhaps we'd better toss up over it. Women are not sex objects, Jack. We are not prizes to be awarded to the winner, Ronald. We're leaving you. Oh, blimey. We are fed up to here with your chauvinist, sexist philosophy. And we found some younger men. What's more, it hasn't escaped our notice that the men get all the best parts in this sketch. Well, it's written by a man. Well, there's a sexist argument for a start. Just because it's written by a man doesn't mean to say it has to be played by men. You'll never win that argument. Why not? Because the writer's written what you just said. Precisely. The writer's merely used a feminist viewpoint in order to sidetrack the truth of your remark and forestall the very criticism you're making. Why are there no Jewish people in this sketch? See, and now he's made a joke of it. Ah, but he's written what you just said. Ah, he's a cunning bastard. Let's stop speaking. That'll show him. Yeah. No, he's written this silence in. We actors are the mere puppets of the writer. He's written that as well. He's written you saying he's written that as well. And he's written you saying he's written you saying he's written that as well. Oh, he's just exercising his power at our expense. He's even written that. Must be mad. Did he write that? No, I'd lived that. Hey, well done. No, I didn't. He wrote it. Let's face it, we're trapped by the writer and he, he's written what I'm saying now. <laughs> These five characters have become aware that they are trapped by the writer in a duff sketch and are quite unable to do anything about it. Suddenly, a cruelly gratuitous stage direction, viciously inserted by the writer in revenge, makes them all change into silly costumes. And he changes them once again with a careless stroke of the pen. Another cruel, unnecessary stage direction isolates this character and writes him into the middle of a duck pond. Why always me? Maddened with power, the writer relentlessly makes them all hop up and down on one leg. Now he makes them put their hands on their heads and go ping. Ping! Now he gets bored with this game and decides to get rid of the set. Then he decides to get rid of the characters. Now he writes in a table and chair, some potted plants, a piano and some screens, a pianist and a silly fellow. Then he makes them play and say the following. Recitation. I went to a wife-swapping party and nobody asked me to swap. 
Deirdre, my wife, had the time of her life with a man from the off-license shop. But his wife was minding the business, and he'd only come with the wine. Still, he went round all night, swapping on site. I do wish he hadn't swapped mine. Now, Deirdre, my wife, she's a shy girl, and she doesn't like to say no. And though in her past she's never been fast, last night she never went slow. But I sat all night at the orgy, and no one asked me to indulge. The things that I saw going on on the floor would make your eyes goggle and bulge. There were things that they did to each other, in places I've not seen before. They were at it like knives with each other's wives. By golly, I bet they'll be sore. Well, finally my flabber was gasted when our grocer, I know him on sight, took a and put it in someone's with a by the near the light. Then they all kind of and then tickled with a. It was really obscene. I've never seen it attempted. I do hope their underwear's clean. My night at the wife swapping party has certainly shattered a dream. Our hostess, they said, was tucked up in bed with half of the Sunderland team. But her husband, our host, he's a nice chap, and he said as he gave me my coat, odd man out, I can see, put his hand on my knee and then stuck his tongue down my throat. Well, I'm not a chap who is prudish. I don't mind a wee bit of fun, but I do draw the line at perversion. There are some things that shouldn't be done. In fact, if I'm honest, we did them. Twice or three times, maybe four. Right there and then, with a bent friend called Ben on the rug on the living room floor. Well, sh well, shack arse on goo is my motto, and we shacked arse on goo all night long. Till midway through the strife, I met Deirdre, my wife, with the grocer and his going strong. What on earth are you doing? She said, Gerald. I don't rightly know, I replied. It's something in Latin, and she, without batting an eyelid, said, come on outside. My God, there was a heck of a hoo-ha about who had done what with whose heck. And Deirdre said she was just tasting wine. Just tasting wine, bloody neck. She had more in her hand than a bottle. Still, it all turned out quite all right, because we decided we both loved each other. And we're going again tonight. Hello, or rather goodbye, because that's about the size of it for this week. Rotten Weekend Television is closing down now and handing you back to the BBC. Yes, I made an awful lot of friends at Bristol. Yes. Saw Mario scoring in the lift. Yes, he didn't see me, but I thought I'd say hello anyway. You know, the expert. I was introduced to a cousin of Esther Ransom's. Yes. I saw Dave Allen in the bar, but then who hasn't? <laughs> And then the little terribly dear, sweet little girl who reads the news. What's her name? Built like a panzer regiment. Yeah. <laughs> she can make you feel guilty just by looking at you. Yeah. I never saw Jimmy Savile, which is always nice and rather rare. Coming soon on Rutton Weekend Television, a brand new series of the popular quiz game Nixon is Innocent, in which members of the public try and name major crimes of which ex-president Nixon was innocent, in exchange for cash or prizes. Can you hear me, Mrs. Rabid? No! Good. Right, now remember, you've got to tell me three major crimes of which ex-president Nixon is innocent. Three? Yes. Oh, blimey. And off you go. Uh... I think he was guiltless of the acid bath murders. Good, yes, that's one. I don't think he was responsible for the surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Is absolutely correct. I don't think he was involved in the start of the French Revolution. Oh. Oh, did he do it? Oh, blimey. No, he didn't do it, Mrs. Rabid, but unfortunately it's not a crime to start the French Revolution. Oh, blimey. Well, never mind, Mrs. Rabid, you've been a jolly decent sport. Nobody leaves this show empty-handed, so we're going to cut off your hands. Oh, thank you. Well, you can see more of Nixon is Innocent next Tuesday on Rutland Weekend Television. <laughs>